who we'll get to as well, who was also in exile. Esther here. Uh, these are people who were in the most uh, anti-faith places, and yet God uses them. <clears throat> and they're not missionaries exactly, are they? Now, if you saw a book on your, your church book table, the woman God uses or the man God uses, and you don't know what it's about, you'd lift it up, you would expect it would be a, a, a story, maybe a biography of a missionary. But uh, Esther was a beauty queen, and she basically leverages her celebrity status as a beauty queen in order to help her people. And you don't think of this as, oh, that's the way we would ordinarily think of a man or a woman God uses, but God uses people everywhere, not just out on the mission field, not just in church, but anywhere you are, God can use you, number one. Number two, um, to be faithful as Christians wherever you are in culture, you have to be willing to lose the palace mm -hmm. if necessary. Mm -hmm. You see... As we're going to, as you know, the story, Esther, <clears throat> in order to identify with her people and to try to uh, repeal an unjust law, she knows that she might lose the status she has. She's a, a queen. She's living in a palace. She's living in a lap of luxury. But she knows that she's going to be faithful to God and to save her people. She's going to have to, uh, uh, mm, yeah, she's going to have to risk losing all that. And actually, all Christians, all believers. If you're really going to be faithful wherever you are, maybe you reach the higher echelons of wealth or maybe you reach the higher echelons of power in some way, you are not being faithful to God unless you're willing to uh, risk that palace, risk losing it in order to be obedient to him. And lastly, um, God's the real king in control. What's fascinating about the whole way the book is written is even though God's never mentioned, it's so clear he's in control of every little thing. Why is it that the, 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 the king one night just happened to not be able to sleep and said, come in to his scribes and all that and read me, read me the, the archives of what's happened recently. And then, oh, Mordecai, ah, I forgot all about him. Yeah, he helped me. Uh, no, that, that just happened to happen. No, it didn't just happen. None of those things just happened to happen. Even though God is hidden in the sense he's not even mentioned in the book, He's clearly behind everything. And so that's a very important, very important theme, is that even when God seems hidden, he's not. Even when God seems hidden, he's there. Even when God seems to be absent, he's working all things according to the counsel of his will. And he's working all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Um, the outline of the book is the first two chapters are about the rise of Esther. The second two chapters, three and four, are about the rise of Haman, the bad guy who tries to wipe out the Jews. The Then five, seven, six, and seven are the choices of Esther, where she realizes she's going to have to risk everything in order to save her people. And then eight, nine, and ten are how God does use Esther to, uh, to save the Jews from annihilation. Uh, Haman is a person who hates the Jews and wants to destroy them. Esther uses her place in the palace to uh, turn the king against Haman and to have the, uh, uh, the law uh, nullified. How does this move the biblical storyline along? Uh, there's a lot of debate about that amongst the biblical scholars, but the thing that I would like to press on you here, this is not getting the Jews back to the promised land. Uh,